Hello and welcome to Chester Baptist Church Bible Study. I'm Alex Ware. Today it's an exciting moment. We get to start a new book, a new study. And I always get excited here because, you know, it's always in, you know, what's the theme? What are we talking about? What's all that sort of stuff? Because I'm an English teacher and that's what, you know, gets me excited. So what can I say? And I'm going to be focusing on language today a little bit. But for today, let's look at, uh, to start off, let's look at the theme of our study this quarter, and it is Jesus calls us. Jesus calls us for many different things in many different ways, and this this is kind of a broader theme, so, you know, we'll get to subtle details as we go through it. But today, I get to start it off, and we're going to be talking about compassion, and compassion is a great thing. Now, before I begin down the discussion of the parables that Jesus is going to tell us, and today we actually get to read stories Jesus told us. We're going to analyze those, but before we do that, I want to read a verse that Paul wrote in Romans 9, 38 and 39. For I am certain that nothing can separate, separate us from his love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor other heavenly rulers or powers, neither the present nor the future, neither the worlds above nor the worlds below. There is nothing in all creation that will ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is ours through Christ Jesus, our Lord. I just think that's so powerful. I mean, that is just powerful. Nothing can separate us from God's love. And that's just a, a quick moment for us to contemplate the power behind that statement and the truth behind that statement and what it means for us. Now, let me go on and move on into our study today, which is going to be in Luke 15. In Luke 15, Jesus tells three parables to murmurers, complainers, ne'er-do-wells. And it's the, the individuals are not necessarily the ones who are yet wanting to crucify him or kill him. This is the ones that are, you know, judging him for what he does. They say, you know, you go in here and you hang out with these sinners, these tax collectors, always about the tax collectors, always about that money. And of course, they're saying you're hanging out with these people that tax collect for the Romans. And there's a huge discussion among these rabbis, these priests that are going how bad Jesus is. And Jesus decides to try to share with them a few parables. Now, at this point, a parable, let's remember how powerful the language can be. Language is the ability to communicate complex ideas and the ability to create stories and tell those stories is not easy. Just ask anyone who's ever had to write an essay for school or had to, you know, discuss something on a Sunday school lesson in front of everyone. It, it, it's a bit daunting to do this and uh, none do better than our Roberta. Of course, we can all agree there, but here Jesus truly is the master, and he demonstrates it with these parables. And he tells to these, these, these ne'er-do-wells, these murmurers, he tells them the parables, first of all, of three different things, all with the same idea, but with different nuances to them. The first parable is about a shepherd who loses his sheep, and how he goes in search for it and finds that sheep and returns and rejoices with that, rejoicing being extremely important in this case. And, but it is, of course, sheep being a property, something that we can tangibly hold on to that we say is, you know, ours, our possessions. Uh, it, the connection there is more of a uh, Alex twist to it, but it's still acceptable because the parable can cover lots of different things and mean different things to different people. What's the beautiful thing about Jesus' parables? The second parable is about a coin and a woman who lost her one coin out of 10 and how she searched for it. And in this searching for this coin, she finds it and is celebrating that as well, celebration again. And this time though, the coin I believe represents the, our security, our wealth, our safety net. As we get older, we want to save our coins and use those coins for our retirement. I'll never get that. But, but the point being that we want those things to be available for us. And we treasure those things. Now, we give to God, of course. We give to the church. We give to the needy and those things. But we also must take care of ourselves. 
I didn't say that we shouldn't do that. So important note there. The third parable is about family, and this is where our focus is. Our focus is on the third parable, one that we all know and know well, the lost son, the prodigal son. I have so many connections to this story now, and it is just amazing to me. Again, language is so powerful. I heard this story as a child, heard one thing. I heard it as a young man, I heard something else. I heard it as an adult, I heard something entirely different. I heard it now as a father, and it is another story altogether. It, 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 that, that is the power of Jesus' parable. Every time you hear it, it's a little different. That's the joy of studying the Bible. But I'm getting digressed. I'm sorry about that. Let's look at the three main characters in our story, in our parable. We have the Father. Uh, of course, to represent God is often case, but I'm going to also put a twist on it to represent humans and how their society looked at it at the time. We also have the oldest son, um, the son who is stays with the Father, and and he is the Pharisees. He's the holy men. And in this case, I believe Jesus is slighting it to the holy men that believe in God and realize who he is and accept it. Because there were those individuals, obviously, he brought many people to God. And then the youngest son. Well, that's all the unbelievers of the world. So now let's analyze our story in more detail. We have this young son who's tired of living at home, doesn't want to be there anymore, and he goes up to his father and says, Pops, give me what is rightfully mine that I may go out and explore the world and do my thing. Now, we got to think about this just one moment. First of all, think about what it means for this era for a boy to come up and tell his father, I want what, your, what I, my inheritance is so I can leave. He's saying to his father, you are dead to me. You, you no longer exist. I am no longer part of this family. I am on my own. I do not need you anymore. That's, that's harsh. That's, that's hard. And for the boy to say this, for this young man to say this to his father, shows how much little regard he has, how little wisdom he has. On top of that, he's saying to his father that, I'm sure this is not the first time they've had this discussion. The father and he have probably had blows or, or arguments about what his actions are and why he's doing what he's doing. And then we go to the father and he gives the son this. Now, did he have to? Did the son do anything to actually earn that from the father? No, the father is giving this of his own free will, of his love, of of what he wishes to do, not that the son deserved it. And I'm going to connect there to God gives us our freedom, our choice, our freedom of choice. And then he says to us, but come back. I will offer my son's death. I will offer this forgiveness to you, even though you don't deserve it. And we don't. We don't deserve any of it, but he still offers it to us. So the father gives this to the Son as Jesus, our God, gives us forgiveness that we don't deserve. Now, that's a little bit, it goes a little bit further because the Son goes his own way, but also I want to think about it in another way. What type of man has to go, okay, I'm tired enough of my son's guff to just, here, here, go and, and go. We've seen it happen in real life. It does occur. It is sad. It's hard to believe. But the father did at some point have to get tired of dealing with his son saying this all the time, I'm sure. Well, again, two sides for the father to look at as we wish. The son goes. He goes and he spends his money extravagantly celebrating, doing all those things that a sailor on shore leave would do. And we all know that that's not exactly the way you should behave. And father was probably aware that this is how his son would act knowing what a foolish man he would do this. And then this son finds himself penniless and now working in a pig farm and looking at the slop the pigs are eating. 
That was a show called Dirty Jobs with Mike Rowe, and it, he one time went on and he did a, a show, uh, see, uh, an episode where he went and worked on a pig farm and they showed what the pigs were eating. And I assure you, that is not something that would at all be appetizing to anyone not completely destitute and desperate. So the son realizes his problem. He comes to his senses finally. And he goes, I'm going to go to my dad. I'm just going to ask for anything, anything. Just put me and make me a slave in your house, a slave in your house, and I will do it. And then, of course, he goes back, and the father, seeing him afar away off, goes, look, my son has returned. Kill the slaughtered calf, uh, slaughter the fatted calf. Let us go and celebrate and welcome my son home. Same way God welcomes all of us when we come to him on bended need, in humility, knowing that we are sinners. He goes, welcome. Let us celebrate the return of my family, my child. Now, I'm going to take a little different turn. We're going to look at this older son. He comes in complaining. Hey, Dad. I've been here. I've been working hard. I've been in the fields. I've been doing it. You said do it. I got it done. It's all been done. Everything's taken care of just the way you wanted. Here I've been there. Why aren't we having a celebrating for him who we you know, said you were dead? Well, of course, Jesus, you know, he's telling this parable and he makes sure the father has an answer for this. And I want to think about it in two ways. First of all, Jesus had an opportunity here to say, you know, yeah, you obeyed all the laws. You've been here with me. You've supported me and everything. But did you really earn this? Do you really earn my wealth, did what I've worked so hard for? Do you, did you earn it? Because the Father could just as easily said that, just as God could tell us we did not earn our salvation. That would be kind of the way the Pharisees and some of the Jewish religious leaders would obey the laws and follow the directions of Moses in the Bible, or, or the, what, what part of the Bible they studied at the time, because again, New Testament. But they did not accept Jesus as being the Son of God, and that, though you obey the laws, you can't work your way into heaven. You have to accept Jesus in order to get there. That's a different take again. But then again, Jesus also gave the answer and said that the father turned to him and said, all of this is yours. All the rest of everything I have is yours. Because those people that did believe in Jesus and did believe in God and realized those connections, they celebrated and they knew that they were going to get their reward in heaven. And God has told us that we would receive our reward in heaven based on our servitude to him and bringing others to Christ. That's what he wants us to do. That's how we can show our love for God. So again, maybe I've given you something to think about. I hope I've given you something to consider over the next week. I pray that everyone is staying healthy and safe and that this festive springtime season can in they infect us all with joy and happiness and smiles. So may God be with you. Let us pray. God, Jesus, we thank you for this beautiful day, and we thank you for the blessing of Jesus in our lives, that you sent him as a sacrifice in our stead, that we may still come to you and know love and grace and forgiveness. Please give us wisdom and happiness, health and joy. In Jesus' name we pray.